Hello, everybody. Honored to be here today, um, particularly on the front row of people who will be following me, who I'm uh, great friends with and, and ardent admirers of. Um, I've been up here in this specific neighborhood a couple of times. I've spoken next door um, at the business uh, school over the years. And it's been interesting because I didn't go to college. I wanted to open a great nightclub. So as a young man, uh, I really, that wasn't part of my future. And the reality is I wouldn't have done good in college because I'm a right brainer. I don't have any left brain whatsoever. I mean, I, I, I can't learn math out of a book. So I've always approached this discussion about measurements from not only the vantage point of a right brainer, but frankly, from the vantage point of the great unwashed masses. Um, I've worked in the basement of a shelter for 23 years. And I'm really interested in, you know, when walking down the street, it's frankly kind of easy to figure out why people lit into this idea that low administrative overhead was the great barometer for the success of an organization. I mean, actually, if you just like the average person walking down the street, and you know, the median income in this country is less than 49 grand. So that's what I'm thinking about. You know, what's, if that person's gonna take a little bit of money out of their paycheck, and whether it's gonna go in their church till, or whether it's gonna go um, to the United Way or come directly to an organization after they look at some of these great search engines to determine who's doing really well. The point is, what's something they can understand? But most importantly, what's something that the average nonprofit can actually do? Now again, I've come at this from two different angles. Because I gotta be honest with you, even though our rating varies from, organ, uh, from uh, different um, partner to partner as far as how many stars we get or how many this or that's, I've worked hard to create what I think is one of the most badass programs in America. I mean, we tear it up 24-7, 365. We don't take any prisoners. You know, and we work really hard to do what we do really well. And I would wager that as these different rating systems evolve, very few organizations would ever be able to compete with the DC Central Kitchen when it comes to effective use of uh, money, but also outcomes. You know, and I'll give you a classic example. Every year we train and place about 80 men and women, and it costs about 800 grand to train those men and women. Now, during the course of their training, they're gonna produce the better part of 1.4 million meals, which saves our city millions of dollars that they would have spent if they had to buy that food on the open market. Plus, we buy about half a million dollars from local farmers to, ins to ensure the health of the meals there so people can heal physically, but also the long-term health benefits that will save our city ample money down the road. Every single one of those graduate goes out and goes out and gets a job. We're really good at this. Now, the majority of those men and women are coming out of prison. Men and women who were it not for programs like the kitchen and really progressive employers, and sometimes that's us because we have our own businesses. Those men and women can earn the better part of $2 million in new salaries every single year. And with that comes all the ancillary benefits to our community from men and women paying rent, buying shoes, putting food on their own table. And then on top of this all, they're gonna contribute well over $200,000 in payroll taxes to our city. But here's the conundrum. At the end of the day, I might work really, really, really hard to not only do this because this is what I'm driven to do, but do it in a way that also is recognized by the rating systems that would say, in effect, here's a great organization. But hence my dilemma. Because at the end of the day, if you had to pick a picture of who's hungry in America, it's a single mom with kids. And as they say down south, she's done, mama forgot to eat so that her kids could eat. And at the end of the day, I don't want to live in a country where feeding a working woman leftover food from a restaurant is okay. And this is the conundrum we face because you can rate these kind of programs all the way to as many stars as you want to create, but that doesn't make them right. And that's what I want to talk to you about. Now, there's two different schools here I want to approach this. Historically, I've come up here to talk about demand. I mean, I'm sorry, supply. I've been over at the business school helping men and women who want to do social enterprise like ours learn how to do that model. And I've been kind of intrigued because over the years, the emphasis has been on the individual organization. How can your organization get to scale? How can your organization do better? I gotta be honest with you, I'm not interested in an individual organization. I always say, you know, uh, my father, who was a Marine Corps pilot, tried his best one last time the day I graduated high school to talk me out of opening a nightclub. And he came up to me and he put his arm around me, you know, and he gave me the big round saucer Popeyes, you know, and, and he looked in my eyes, he said, son, you know, man, you love to talk. You should be a salesperson. Man, and I'm like, man, what did I ever do to you? You know, why would you, why would you say that to me? He meant well. But the reality is, I am a real good salesperson. Now, if I came up here and all I wanted to do was tell you about the DC Central Kitchen, man, right on, I got a great product. I can talk all day long. But I'm a social entrepreneur. It's the idea I'm selling. And the kitchen's just an example of the idea. And that's what I'm interested in, is really not so much the supply side. You know, that's where our emphasis has been. How do we get individual organizations to become better and better? I'm interested in demand. Now, to be honest with you, when I was a kid, 
You want to know something interesting? There was hardly any women chefs in America when I first went into the nightclub business. In fact, really, the only time you saw women was wearing St. Pauli girl outfits behind the bar waiting on tables. But now you go to any city in America, and there's women chefs, there's women professionals, women own restaurants all over America. And in fact, when I was a kid, there was only 10 great restaurants in America. And every single one of them was a French restaurant, period. That was it. There was no such thing as a four-star Mexican or Italian or Chinese restaurant. Those were nice restaurants and good food, to be sure. But the real zenith. So similarly, if somebody had come along suddenly and said, man, we need more great restaurants in America, the average thinker would have said, well, we need to open more French cooking schools. Well, an interesting phenomenon happened, and particularly down in Washington, D.C., a town I've been proud to call home for the last 40 years, because as I was coming up in the biz, all of a sudden, there was a rating page, if you will, in the Washington Post for restaurants. Out of the blue, they decided they were going to start to review restaurants. Now, what's interesting about this is they, the woman who was chosen, because this, the restaurant view page wasn't going to be on the front page of the business page and the sport page. It was going to be on the women's page. You know, back then, the style section was where women writers were put. Women didn't get to write on the sports page back then. And except for a few pioneers like Ellen Goodman, very few women appeared on the op-ed page. So the new food review system went on the women's page, and Phyllis Richmond was um, named to be the reviewer of restaurants. Now, I'll be honest with you, the French chefs in D.C. had kittens at the notion that a woman was going to review their restaurants. But what was wild about Phyllis Richmond is she was anonymous. So you never know who she was. Her picture always shielded her face, which meant overnight, any woman who came into those restaurants had power. And the reaction amongst the restaurateurs who used to heretofore kind of sneer almost at customers, all of a sudden, there was a great sense of, I must compete. I'm going to be, my, my restaurant's going to be reviewed, and any woman coming in. And overnight, I was in this industry, all of a sudden, you started to have waiter meetings in, in, in the beginning of every night, where the chef would come out and tell you what was on the, in case anybody asked, here's what's on the menu, here's how we cooked it. And they said, in effect, if any woman asks a question, you come and get me. And overnight, this revolutionized our industry. All of a sudden, we went from just a handful of great restaurants in 1962. I was just in Boise, Idaho. And there was unlimited amounts of really spectacular restaurants, organizations that proudly talked about the fact that they hired women. They, they didn't throw away their food. They paid a good wage. They reinvested in the community. They bought from local farmers. That was driven by consumers. And I'm going to ask Jeff to bring up one thing, because there's two things I'm going to talk to you about as far as supply. In thinking about this, and having been um, proudly a member of many things, we instituted at the DC Central Kitchen an effort to drive demand um, by a volunteer bill of rights. Every single year, we have 14,000 volunteers. Now, we have a process called the, the calculated epiphany at the DC Central Kitchen. I don't want to tell people what to think, but I definitely have an idea what I want them leaving thinking. So our attitude has always been, let's set the stage and let it happen organically so that men and women go out and work side by side with men and women. What they used to, in the old system, maybe serve across a table because I have a job and I'm volunteering to somebody who doesn't have a job. We bring everybody around to the same tide where they work side by side. And we produce almost 7,000 meals a day using food that primarily used to be thrown away, or again, food we buy from local farmers. That proximity, that ability to stop and say, wow, I never thought about the economic power of nutrition. I never thought about men and women who, I had this image of who went to prison or who came out of prison, and the person I worked with all day who taught me how to hold a knife and walked me through this process and is now somebody I can be Facebook friends with, this changed everything about my mind. So we decided, rather than just letting that happen, how could we really spur this and make it happen a little bit faster? So we put up on our wall this idea of a bill of rights, saying, in effect, you as a volunteer have the right to work in a safe environment. You have the right to be treated with respect by all staff members. You have to be a right to be engaged in meaningful work and to be actively included regardless of any physical limitations. But this is the bomb right here. Be told what impact your work made in the community. Now, every day in America, 90 million, I mean, every year in America, 90 million people volunteer. No other country in the world even remotely comes close. And in fact, this university and every single university in America is full to the brim with a generation we have raised doing service. A generation, recent census data reveals, is over 90 million strong. And I want to repeat that. There are 90 million people under 25 coming up. This is the most diverse generation ever in the history of America. Raised doing a service. The ability to, to communicate globally with the push of a button. You could, make it, you could make a case that they are poor, plugged in, and pissed off, and they are coming. You know, and we all go to dinner with people who take a picture of their dinner and post it. Now again, imagine if you went to a restaurant 
and somebody came out and treated you, sisters, in a sexist manner, or anybody of color here as somehow unequal in America, would you take that? No, you wouldn't. And in fact, you have more than you used to have ever. Now you have the power of your handheld to say, I just went to a restaurant and was treated shabbily. Don't anybody go here. And that has power. Now imagine 90 million volunteers in America saying, if you can't tell me what I did today, how I fundamentally changed this community, how I decreased the demand for this service tomorrow, I'm not coming back. And not only am I not coming back, but I'm going to tell my friends. That will drive innovation fast. And I'll be honest with you, when I say fast, I mean fast, because tick, 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 every single day. From my end of the business, 10,000 people turn 60 every single morning in America. You almost think, you, I swear, you should, you should be able to hear a sigh every morning if you put your head out the window at the idea of 10,000 people looking in the mirror and seeing themselves and realizing that that clock's ticking. And they're coming too. These two giant groups of men and women, a, a generation under 25, looking to merge spirituality, lifestyle, and income. A generalization, I know, but hell-bent on merging those things, saying, in effect, I have to make a living, but if I can find a place to do it, where I not only don't do harm, I do good, sign me up. And they are not going to be satisfied with painting the shelter wall for the 88th time or chopping vegetables so a working woman could be fed. They're going to want a solution, and they're going to drive innovation. And the same thing can be said for those 80 million baby boomers, men and women who heard Barbara Jordan or Dr. King or Marvin Gaye or John Lennon with their own ears and are coming back. This will be the deepest well of life experience in the history of the world. No, any, no other generation has ever lived this long, ever, and will have this much that, that was this free, this rich, and this educated. So these two groups coming together, each demanding some sense of movement, that I believe will have more potential power to drive innovation in the nonprofit sector than anything yet imagined. But I want to touch on one more thing before I leave. We were lucky enough two weekends ago to have the first family come and visit the DC Central Kitchen. And it was just two days after um, the president had made his speech outlining the need for a jobs agenda in America. Now, for everybody else in the DC Central Kitchen, this was a triumphant day. You know, for men and women who a couple of years ago were just scrounging for a little bit of money to make it through the day or trying to stay alive in prison, being able to work side by side with the President of the United States is a dream hardly imagined. You know, and for men and women who work in our, um, in our school program, the ability to talk to the First Lady, about how we do locally sourced cook from scratch meals for seven DC public schools, but more importantly, how we're experimenting with the idea of campus kitchens, of which, of which there's 60,000 in America, as learning labs, so that manipulative learners like me can learn fractions with baking cups. At any level, people at the kitchen were excited. I was let down, because I had hoped that the president was going to be here to talk about the fact that we've added 50 jobs this year. 50 jobs, primarily for, men and women, primarily for men and women out of prison, starting at 13 an hour with full benefits. I was hoping he might have taken this moment to really take the whole non out of nonprofit and let put America on notice that anybody who creates a job needs to be part of the America of the future. But he didn't. He talked about service. True, you know, a magnificent part of America's experience, to be sure. But I wanted more. And in fact, I want no, more not just from the President of the United States, but any candidate in the world. So one of the things as far as, again, going back to demand, I really think it's imperative that we as a nonprofit sector elect a generation of people who don't, aren't burdened by the notion of .com, .org. Don't say, in effect, it's time to create jobs. Let's turn to the business world and let the nonprofit sector clean up the mess afterwards. You know, you may know right now as we speak, the super committee in Washington, D.C. is determining no matter how many stars any nonprofit gets, that the ability for people who make over $200,000 to give and get 35% of their dollar donated, that's on the table. You know, and the nonprofits aren't at the table. This is the universal, um, the unifying principle for nonprofits in America. No matter who you are, you know, our ability to go out, we're being asked every single day, no matter how efficient we are, we're being asked to do more. And every single day, the grants that we used to get, the funds we used to have from the federal government are being cut, and now, the federal government wants to cut the amount of money people can write off on their deductions. Now, it is not as if our funding should be sacrosanct, to be sure, but what drives me nuts is in this environment, we're not at the table. We're not electing people. We're trying to educate people once they're in office, as opposed to really sending people who are armed already on day one with a vision that includes social enterprise, microcredit, and who seek out and want to partner with high-performing organizations. 
government remains the major funder of nonprofits in America. Yet, for the most part, all the, all the legislation that's being proposed, and you see it all across America, in cities, in states, and at the federal level, it's based on antidote. It's based on what they think nonprofits do. And this is the one thing that unifies all of our panelists. The era in which we could assume that people knew about us, our hope they'd take us into consideration has passed. Now we must really find and elect partners in office who, again, come equipped, fully equipped, to partner with us, again, not just to meet services, not just to do charity more efficient, but to fundamentally break the back of poverty in America, to pioneer bold new ways in which you can both meet the need and, and, and solve the problem at the very same time. The DC Central Kitchen is a truly pioneering organization, but we are just one of thousands, tens of thousands, across this country every single day. People who wake up hell-bent on making change won't take no for an answer, but what we need more than anything else, again, is a public that is fully aware of what we do and demanding of more, but also a political apparatus in our country that again sees us not as charity, but as equal partners in changing America. Thank you very, very much. So if, if there are, um, thank you, Robert. If there are any questions for Robert, there'll be um, some people on the side with microphones, so please raise your hand if you have a, a question or a comment. Oh, um, all the way in the back. I think, I think they, I, they're, they're struck dumb. <laughs> yes, I did. I was lucky enough to have a moment. Um, uh, and again, I try to be respectful. You know, I've, I'll be honest with you, I've lived in D.C. a long time, and I never want to just uh, rush at somebody who I know has many things on their plate. But I did take a moment. We did have a very robust conversation about the economic role nonprofits play. We are 10% of the American economy, 10% of the workforce, and we channel the energy of 90 million volunteers every year. We have $3 trillion in assets and $300 billion in annual revenue. We are the economic equivalent of India. I always say this, we might have a permanent seat on the UN Security Council if we were a country, yet we don't have a say in Baltimore's budget process. Um, so that must change. And again, the president was very respectful. But again, I had hoped, given the, um, the arc that he was on, that he would leave DC Central Kitchen. And when he went to the next stop, say in effect, you won't believe what I just saw. But you know what, what I saw isn't, isn't out of the ordinary, it's actually in your town, and your town, and your town, and it's part of my vision. And I will not stop until every presidential candidate and every mayor's candidate speaks that language. Right on, you can clap. Other questions? Right on. Thank okay, you. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>